American movie-going audiences sat in awe, watching Hollywood Zeppelins bombing London, while heroic British airplanes brought them down in bright hydrogen flames. The giant rigid airships were perceived as technological wonders, yet the realities of the Great War were nothing like the movies. The Italians were actually the first to use the airship in a shooting war. And it was the Italians who would introduce the semi-rigid airship to America. The British were actually the first to use airships in the Great War. The French adjutant Vincent No flew reconnaissance and the Florus I made history's first air raid on August 9th, 1914 dropping four explosives on German territory. The war to end all wars would spawn an entirely new industry to build Zeppelins for America. Chancellor Otto von Bismarck's dream of a unified Germany seemed unlikely on a continent surrounded by rivals. One of Bismarck's officers in the war with France in 1870, a Graf, or Count, Ferdinand von Zeppelin, had witnessed a Union observation balloon in the American Civil War. Zeppelin envisioned a sky train of hydrogen balloons inside a rigid framework to distribute the weight of the payload and crew, as well as the motors to power it against the wind. Zeppelin was later forced into retirement, where he committed his resources to building a floating hangar and make the concept real. Zeppelin's LZ-1 flew on July 2nd, 1900. Two more flights failed to raise the interests of his former colleagues in the German military. Count Zeppelin would persist through numerous modest successes and disappointing failures until he went bankrupt following the crash of his fourth airship. Yet Zeppelin's popularity would inspire the German people to donate funds to build another airship. Finally, the army purchased the LZ-3 and the new LZ-5, but the German Navy did not want Zeppelins. The Zeppelin plant manager, Alfred Kohlsmann, convinced the Count to form the world's first passenger airline, the German Airship Travel Company, or DELAG. The summer of 1911 offered sustained good weather as commanders perfected the art of handling the large rigid airship. The original Schwaben was eventually joined by three other improved airships to rack up thousands of safe passenger miles. American Spanish war hero, Admiral Dewey, advocated building a Navy rigid airship in 1913. U.S. Navy Commander Jerome Hunsacker conducted a European fact-finding trip during which he bought a ticket on the Victoria Louise. Returning to America, Hunsacker filed a report, but America would be slow to move toward large airships. The happy days of daylag carrying passengers on jaw rides came to an end in June of 1914, when an assassin's bullet killed the heir to the Austro-Hungarian crown. The great European powers had no real reason to go to war, 
but their intricate political alliances would not calm the battling Balkans. Diplomatic miscalculations spread the conflict. Few could have foreseen the ghastly slaughter as the mechanized conflict stagnated into trench warfare. All sides tried to gain technological advantage, so the conflict expanded into the skies. The German military established a Zeppelin Air Force. The Austro-Hungarian Army lent the Zeppelin works a gifted structural engineer, Dr. Karl Arnstein. Arnstein's innovations improved the Zeppelin structures. The rival Schutte Lanz company began supplying wooden-framed airships. By 1916, there were four factories building rigid airships in Germany. As the brutal war continued, Zeppelins hastily employed as bombers began falling victim to improved defenses. The L-33 was shot up so badly it could not escape England, so the crew landed it and set it afire. British Army Commander Charles Ivor Campbell set up shop in Essex to reverse engineer plans from the remains. The airplane defenders developed three-part ammunition that could shred and ignite the flammable airships. New lightweight height climbing airships were developed to fly higher than the fighters could reach. In neutral America, a joint Army-Navy airship board was formed in October 1916. Finally, America chose a side and joined the meaningless slaughter. American flyers trained in British non-rigids and hunted U-boats in French airships. In late October 1917, 11 naval zeppelins were sent out on a raid that was thwarted by defenders and bad weather. Only seven made it back to base. One of these height climbers, the L-49, exhausted its fuel and was forced to land at bourbon le bain in France. The crew was unable to set it on fire before the downed air monster was captured by French troops. French constructor Sabatier arrived to make detailed plans of this most advanced German super zeppelin. These plans were shared with the English, who immediately set about building copies. In an effort to resupply the German East African Army, L-59 was loaded with war supplies and flown from Bulgaria to the outskirts of Khartoum before it was turned back by a false radio signal. The L-59 returned to its base safely, recording more than 4,000 miles. When the Great War finally ended in November 1918, a French assessment of the Jutland Sea Battle overcredited the Zeppelin scouts with saving the German fleet. The great powers sought to apply that success in their own navies. Without a military contract, Luftschabau Zeppelin had enough materials in Friedrichshafen to assemble a new passenger airship, LZ-120, the Bodensee. Limited passenger flights were resumed, offering alternative transportation amid the chaos that had overtaken defeated Germany. Great Britain was the first to complete Zeppelin copies. Many hoped to demonstrate the newfound prowess of aeronautical technology by crossing the Atlantic. The R-34 left East Fortune, Scotland on July 2nd, 1919, under the command of Major G.H. Scott. American Navy Lieutenant Zachary Lansdowne was on board to become the first American to fly the Atlantic. The R-34 arrived at Mineola, Long Island, and the British would prove it was possible to travel round trip across the Atlantic Ocean. On behalf of U.S. Army General William Mitchell, Colonel William Hensley flew back to England in the R-34, arriving on the 13th of July. Examining the airship works there, he then traveled to Germany. Zeppelin L-72, completed too late for the war, was still in the factory, and Hensley tried to purchase it for the U.S. Army. But the War Department stopped these Army efforts. Prevented from securing a Zeppelin, the U.S. Army turned its attention to an experienced ally, Italy, which had built sophisticated semi-rigid airships 
and a system of bases. The army brought over airmen to train on the huge Italian semi-rigid, the Roma. The army bought it and packed it for shipment to America. The Navy would also purchase a semi-rigid of the Italian O-Class. The victors blamed Germany for the war. They decreed the German Navy would be divided amongst the victors. Rather than surrender the airships, several crews pulled out shoring timbers and cut them loose from their hangars, allowing them to crash to the floor. Back in the United States, it was decided to establish one Zeppelin base near Lakehurst, New Jersey, and to construct an airship based on plans of the L-49 captured in France. In a hurry to have a rigid sooner, but technically still at war with Germany, the U.S. Navy decided to purchase the world's largest airship, the British R-38, then still under construction. A Navy detachment led by Commander Lewis Maxfield reported to Howden, England to begin training on British rigids. The Americans flew on the R-34 and the streamlined R-80. R-38 made her first flight in Cardington, England on June 23, 1921. Early flights showed her girders needed strengthening. She was moved to the British airship base in Howden, Yorkshire, and was printed with Navy insignia and numbered ZR-2. She had flown about 57 hours when she began what was to be her fourth checkout and training flight on August 24, 1921. Conducting high-speed turns, the airship suddenly broke in two. Ripped electrical cables from still-running generators ignited gasoline from the broken fuel lines. There was an explosion. The forward section gas bags and hydrogen burned, and it fell into the river of fire, killing all but four of the 26 British on board. The stern section drifted down into the river Humber, carrying the only American survivor, Rigger Norman Walker, 17 of the most experienced U.S. Navy airshipmen, including Commander Maxfield, were lost in the accident. In America, meanwhile, the Italian airship Roma's envelope material had turned moldy by the time the airship was reassembled at Langley Field, Virginia. Many holes had been patched when Roma made her American debut on November 15th. The Unsoldo engines, accustomed to sunny Italy, balked in frigid Virginia. On December 21, 1921, the Roma flew to Washington, D.C. Miss Von Rose Wainwright, daughter of the Assistant Secretary of War, christened the airship with liquid air, prohibition being the law of the land. Italian Ambassador Ronald Ritchie praised America for saving the proud Italian name, Invincible Roman, since nothing on earth or sky was stronger. After the Roma returned to Langley Field with only one engine running, the Army replaced the Ansaldos with more reliable Liberty engines in January of 1922. The crude arrangement necessitated changing propellers in flight to get reverse thrust, and this situation would not be remedied by the engine change. Taking to the sky on February 21st, 1922, Roma had only been flying an hour when its nose section appeared to buckle. A tail cable broke, the controls became unresponsive, and it sank into the Norfolk Army Quartermaster Depot. Roma broke a power line and hit the ground. Fire spread to the hydrogen gas and to the gasoline fuel. While 11 crewmen managed to escape the flames, 34 men died. Americans had been working to develop a method of extracting non-flammable gas, helium, from natural gas fields in Texas. While both Army and Navy officers protested it would end flying as they knew it, Congress cut funding for hydrogen airships. A helium test inflation of U.S. Navy non-rigid airship C-7 proved successful. Lieutenant R.F. Wood and later Lieutenant Commander Zachary Lansdowne operated the C-7 before its helium was retrieved, while helium was fireproof. 
It provided lesser performance at much greater cost. Helium would have a profound effect on the embryonic naval airship program.